Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started for the second session here today at uh, TEDxU Illinois. Um, thank you so much for coming and for coming back, um, if you're new or old here. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Leon Dash, who is the Swanland Chair in College of Communications. Um, Professor Dash is a, I don't even know where to start. Um, he's a winner of the Pulitzer Prize, I think is the, the thing that, will, that should top his list. He was a war correspondent for the Washington Post in West Africa, covered Angola. Um, he is, of course, most famous for his book, um, well, for his Pulitzer Prize story, Rosalie's Story, which then became Rosalie, a mother and her family in urban America. Um, he also earned an Emmy Award for the National Academy of Sci for Television Arts and Sciences for a documentary series, and in 1999, NYU selected Rosalie's Story as one of the best 100 works in 20th century American journalism. Um, continuing that vein, Professor Dash is going to speak today, as he put it in a talk on about journalism and the underclass, and talk about the matters of life and death that face the American underclass. So please give a warm hand for Professor Leon Dash. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk today about something that's been on my mind. Recently, uh, the grandson of a woman who um, I followed for about four years very intensely contacted me. His name is Rocky Lee Brown, Jr. And he's doing a, a life sentence in a prison uh, for homicide. Um, and I first met him when he was 18 and came to live with his grandmother. Her name is Rosalie Cunningham. Um, and I was beginning a project on the underclass by following Rosalie, all eight of her children, five of her grand, five of her 30 odd grandchildren, and her, um, about five or six of her uh, brothers and sisters. Um, and I watched him follow a classic pattern while I was doing the research and the interviewing. Um, as I mentioned, I met him in 1990. He was 18. He had just been released from a group home in Pittsburgh. He had been taken away from his mother when he was 10 because he was out of control and holding up people in the neighborhood in Washington in Northwest Washington, D.C., with a knife. And after 10 instances of this, the court decided that he was a 10-year-old boy who was totally out of control. In fact, there was speculation in the courtroom that his mother was afraid of him. Um, and he had been in group homes from the age of 10 until the age of 18. Then in, when he was released, came to live with his grandmother, um, Rosalie Cunningham. And in two years, he was locked up for armed robbery. And so I went to visit him at the prison where he was locked up. Um, and then four years after that release, in 95, he committed another armed robbery, was convicted in 96, and... Um, was doing, the last time I saw him was in 96 at a prison outside of Washington for the armed robbery conviction. Apparently after he was released from the, um, arm ro the second armed robbery conviction, he then committed a homicide. And it is a classic pattern that is really afflicting um, the African American community in the United States where 50% of all prisoners in the U.S. prison system are African-American males. And he's just one of them. Um, Rosalie, his grandmother, I met in Washington, D.C.'s jail in January of 1988 and began collecting her story. She had been arrested at the intersection of 14th and W Streets Northwest in Washington, D.C. in October 1987, selling heroin to feed three of her grandchildren. The mother of the three grandchildren was in the D.C. jail at the time for selling crack, cocaine. Um, and after I met her and I interviewed her over a nine-day period in one of the female cell blocks, 
she told me that her younger sister was in the adjoining cell block, that her oldest son was at a um, prison, Washington, D.C. prison at the time, called Lawton. Her second son was in a prison in Puerto Rico for bringing heroin onto a naval base in Puerto Rico because his wife was in the Navy. Um, her, third born, her third born son was doing well. Her fourth born son was in another prison for burglary. Her fifth born son was um, where she was going to go and she was going to go and live with him after she was paroled. Um, her, her oldest daughter was running a crack den in northwest Washington. The son that followed him um, was working for the oldest daughter mixing crack cocaine powder, mixing cocaine powder into crack. And the youngest daughter had just left prison. This was the beginning of a project that I had been interested in doing for some time uh, on the American underclass. And Rosalie's family was truly an underclass family. Um, luckily, the Urban Institute, I say luckily for me, the Urban Institute had released a definition of what after a considerable amount of study, what constituted an underclass family. Um, and, uh, and the definition had five parts. One, an underclass family was female-headed. Two, welfare dependent. Um, marginally educated, on almost no high school graduates in the family. And um, chronically unemployed between the ages of 18 and 65. And the fifth part of the definition told me where I would go to look for the families that I wanted to study. And that fifth part said that petty criminal enterprise was a significant financial contribution to the welfare stipend. So I went into the DC jail and began interviewing entire family units that were in the, fa in the DC jail. Um, and out of 40 men and 40 women, I selected four families to follow. And Rosalie's was one of them. And that became impossible, trying to keep up with them once they paroled and free. A lot of their behavior was driven by drug use, drug sales, and, uh, or they were high. And um, they didn't want me around when they were high, <laughs> asking them a lot of questions. <laughs> when they were busy selling drugs, they didn't want me around. Um, so that became problematic in terms of following all four families. But Rosalie, shortly after she was released from prison in May of 1988, uh, went on methadone. Uh, and was looking after her three grandchildren, so she was relatively stable, so I focused on Rosalie. The pattern, uh, her family pattern is a classic American family pattern in terms of her um, grandparents and parents were sharecroppers in Northampton County, North Carolina, on the Bishop and Powell Plantation near Rich Square, North Carolina. They had been there since their forebears had been emancipated at the end of the Civil War. Um, and sharecropping, if you know anything about it, was literally another form of slavery. They did not get educations, um, and their labor was exploited. They were, got very little in return for their labor. But in 1932, during the height of the Great Depression, the owner of the farm, Joe Purvis, lost it to a bank. And the family, the grandparents, Thaddeus Lawrence and Eugenia Lawrence, and um, their daughter, Ro Rosalie's mother, Rosetta and Earl Wright, moved to do sharecropping outside of Leonardtown, Maryland. They did that for 
three years, um, and then moved to Washington in the fall of 1935. Rosalie was born the following October. <clears throat> Rosalie attended um, elementary school, a school called Giddings Elementary School, in what was then the rigidly segregated school system of Washington, D.C. And um, she was never taught to read. We, went, we visited the school several times during the course of my interviewing her. And the only thing that I could figure out was that the poor kids were kept on the first floor of Giddings Elementary School, and the middle class black kids were on the second floor. And the kids on the second floor were getting an education because their parents had enough education to come to the school and check on their, their children's progress. Rosalie's parents and grandparents didn't have that ability and would have been thoroughly intimidate, intimidated about going to ask a teacher what was the status of their daughter and granddaughter. Um, eventually, Rosalie was graduated from the sixth grade, still not reading at all. And the teacher, a teacher, came to her mother's house to tell her mother that Rosalie was being sent on to Randolph Junior High School, not because she could do the work, but because she had gotten too old to stay any longer at Giddings Elementary School. Within that first year, Rosalie got pregnant with her first child and dropped out of school. <clears throat> the motivation for the pregnancy was to get the attention of a good-looking boy and make her girlfriends jealous. And to hold on to the boy, she made herself available, sexually available, to the boy. Um, she got pregnant and never saw him again, and that was her firstborn son, Bobby. She went on to have seven additional children by three different men. Um, the three youngest children were fathered by a man who did stay around for a while, um, but he had significant problems with, uh, he was an alcoholic. So there wasn't much guidance for the children from him. <clears throat> Her oldest daughter, Patty Cunningham, uh, and the mother of the man that I'm talking, I was telling you about earlier, Rocky Lee Brown, Jr., um, gave birth to Rocky Lee when she was 14. And by the age, by, the, by his age of two, she, she was 16 and a full-blown heroin addict. So there wasn't much guidance for him in terms of growing up. There was a lot of, there was some physical abuse of him by the mother as she would punch him with her fist up to the point that he started threatening her with a knife if she continued that up, she continued doing that. And as a result, he became a totally uncontrolled uh, young man. Um, Rosalie um, got involved. Rosalie began shoplifting when she was 13. In fact, that's when she got her first, when she first arrested and spent nine days in a juvenile facility. And the day she was released, she continued to shoplift. She felt it was her right to shoplift, that there was no, no other way for her to get the kind of clothes that made her feel good about herself and made her feel attractive. And she continued to shoplift from the age of 13 to the age of 55. She finally stopped shoplifting at 55, she told me, because she had gotten too slow. And people, it was too easy for people to catch her. She cycled in and out of the prison system. In fact, I think the prison system really kept her alive um, because she, was a, she, had, she herself became a heroin addict after her daughter. And the prison system was the only place where she got um, some medical attention, poor medical attention in the prison system, but it was the only place where she got any. Her crimes were prostitution, drug use, drug sale, and shoplifting. Um, six of her eight children followed her into that pattern of life. Um, 
All of them helped her with her drug dealing as young children. Um, the six that I'm talking about, four of her sons and two of her daughters, also became drug addicts and criminal recidivists, cycling in and out of the prison system constantly, up until today, up until today. And now it has spilled over into uh, a third generation. Her grandson, um, Rocky Lee Brown, is not the only one of her grandchildren who is following the same pattern in and out of prison. Um, he never really got a quality education. Yeah, you, <clears throat> you can, it's, um, you, you sort of have to second guess when you're reading his letters as to what he meant. Um, and that's something that's consistent with most of the men locked up in America's prisons. Most of them are reading at a third grade level, uh, almost all of them. Uh, and he's, he's no exception. <coughs> Um, the, the, the thing that is um, poignant when you think about Rocky Lee Brown Jr. and other men like him, for me, is that it doesn't have to be that way. And while I mentioned that Rosalie had eight children, two of them, <coughs> the third born son, and the fifth born son, Alvin Cunningham and Eric Wright, have never done, never done any drugs uh, and never gone to prison, never been arrested for any crime. Um, and I was very curious about how they had avoided that when drugs and crime were all around them. Um, Alvin, when he was uh, in the third grade at elementary school, had developed um, a sense of shame about living on welfare. Uh, the closest I could get by what caused his shame was that he lived in housing project, public housing at the time, where, um, and this is in a period where people of different social class levels lived in public housing, where um, he had a crush on a girl whose family was working poor but they were not welfare poor. This is in the era before food stamps, and um, the Department of Agriculture would deliver food once a month to welfare-dependent families. Alvin refused to go out to the truck when Rosalie would send her children out to get her family's allotment because he didn't want this, the family of the girl on whom he had a crush to see him because they felt, he felt that they would uh, forbid him from visiting their daughter if they found out his family was welfare poor. He was also a quiet, sort of introverted person. And he um, was invited into the middle class African American homes in that neighborhood uh, and began forming friendships with middle class children. And he noticed that when he was there, playing with them, he was often invited to sit down and join them for dinner. And there was flatware on the table. The television was turned off. Um, there was a lot of social interaction between the adults and the children. And his life was entirely different. In fact, he was really being raised by his oldest brother, Bobby. Because Rosalie often went out every day shoplifting, or she was busy dealing drugs, or doing any number of criminal things to supplement the family's income. Um, but Alvin early on decided that this was the way he wanted to go. And um, with this exposure to these middle class families. And when he reached the sixth grade in Evans Junior High School, he picked out a man who was one of his teachers in history that he wanted to emulate a man named Gottel Franklin. Gottel Franklin at the time was not planning to do anything with any youth outside of teaching in classroom. He had just graduated from Howard University in Washington, D.C. He had a red Corvette convertible, and he was planning to pay his student loan and party. 
And um, <clears throat> uh, but Alvin insisted that he do something for him, and he would show up at Gartel Franklin's house every morning to go to school and every weekend uh, to get lessons from lessons on life. Gartrell Franklin ended up mentoring Alvin for the next 20 years. And as a consequence, Alvin himself lives a very solid middle-class life today. He's a supervisor in the Metro subway system. Uh, and with that, I'll end, because my time is up. <laughs> Thank you.